thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm gonna let everyone file into the room. We're eagerly awaiting tonight's author, um, who is be, has been slightly delayed finishing up another interview. So while we wait his arrival, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and housekeeping information, and we'll get that out of the way so that when he joins us, we can jump right into the, uh, to the interview. So thank you all for your patience. My name is Allison Sansoni. I'm the program director at the American Writers Museum. Thank you all for coming to our online program. If you like the kinds of programs you're seeing from the AWM, you can join the museum as a member and get advanced notice and special access to upcoming exhibits and events. We hope to see you all in Chicago at our museum in the coming months. We're here tonight to talk with Lawrence Lemer about his new book, Capote's Women, True Story of Love, Betrayal, and a Swan Song for an Era. The book delves into a time in Truman Capote's life after publishing Breakfast at Tiffany's and In Cold Blood, when Capote was beset with writer's block and self-loathing, searching for the story that would become his doomed magnum opus, Answered Prayers. Lawrence Lemer is best known for his trilogy on the Kennedys, the Kennedy women, the Kennedy men, and Sons of Camelot. His book, Playing for Keeps in Washington, was named a notable book of the year by the New York Times. He also wrote the bestseller, Make Believe, the story of Ronald and Nancy Reagan. And his writing has appeared in numerous publications. I'm going to read, while we wait for him, I'm going to read a little bit of the uh, description of the book. Um, there are certain women, Truman Capote wrote, who though perhaps not bo born rich are born to be rich. Barbara, Babe Paley, Gloria Guinness, Marella Agnelli, Slim Hayward, Pamela Churchill, CZ Guest, Lee Radziwill, Jackie Kennedy's sister. They were the toast of mid-century New York, each beautiful and distinguished in her own way. Capote befriended them, received their deepest confidences, and ingratiated himself into their lives. Then in one fell swoop, he betrayed them in the most surprising and startling way possible. For years, Capote attempted to write answered prayers, what he believed would have been his magnum opus. But when he eventually published a few chapters in Esquire, the thinly fictionalized lives and scandals of his closest female confidants were laid bare for all to see, and he was banished from their high society world forever. This book recreates the lives of these fascinating swans, their friendships with Capote and one another, and the doomed quest to write what could have been one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. Here we are. Sir, we can hear, we can, uh, hopefully you can hear us. I can definitely hear you. Wonderful. Well, let's go with that. <laughs> let's do, let's, let's take what we can get from our, uh, from our technology this evening. Thank you for, uh, for trying so many ways to, to get in the, in the door. Okay. There I am. There you are. Thank you so much for doing this. We appreciate okay. you joining us. I stood up so badly. Oh, it's, it, it happens. It happens. The reason my background is blurred is because occasionally during um, these programs, something will just, you know, you'll just see something fly by. So the, the show must go on. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I introduced you to our audience um, while we were waiting for you and um, started a little bit to talk a little bit about the, the book just to give people a little bit of background. Um, I was wondering if we could start by sort of talking about where Truman Capote is in his career um, during the period that you write about. Tell us about where he was as a writer at that point. Well, the book actually tells the story of his whole life, but, but, the, but the story, it's about answered prayers. In mm -hmm. 19, 1958, he'd, he'd written a novel in 1948 that was, uh, was 23 years old. It was a success. He'd had done other things. He was doing journalism for the New Yorker magazine. And in 58, he said, I've got, you know, I've got to do this big book. I've got to, I want to be famous. I want to be a great writer. And I'm going to do this book called Answered Prayers about these elegant, rich women that I know. I'm going to tell their stories. And I, it's going to be the American pounder card of Marcel Proust uh, or, or Edith Wharton's books about the Gilded Age. It's going to be a masterpiece. So that was the whole idea. And, and he ingratiated himself with these women. He went on their yachts and their planes and, and their homes all over the world. And he, and he constantly looking, constantly thinking, constantly, constantly observing, constantly gaining material for this masterpiece. 
So how did he first meet these women? What was his entree into this world? Well, the first one is Babe Paley. He, he, uh, he had, uh, he had uh, done a screenplay uh, for, for the producer, for a producer who, uh, who, uh, who, who invited him on uh, on Paley's uh, on Paley's plane? The, Paley was the was the founder of CBS, and uh, Paley thought Truman was coming. It was pres former President Truman, but here comes this five foot two inch gay guy, this flamboyant fl fl gay guy with a, with a scarf down to his down, down to his shoes, gets on the plane, and. Uh, he walks there, and 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 Paley can't believe this. And and Truman sits down next to Babe Paley, Paley's wife, and they become close friends and intimates. And through Babe, he meets these other women. He had conflicting feelings about the the world in which this these women moved. It, it wasn't his world, and but yet he was attracted to it. Can you tell us a little bit about how no, no. he he was in this in environment? <laughs> He's this poor kid. He was brought up by his aunts and his relatives in Monroeville, Alabama, and uh, he ends up in New York. He 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 barely gets a high school degree. I mean, he barely gets a high school. Degree. He's totally self-educated man, and he he sees this world of glamour and wealth and beauty. He loves beauty, beautiful things, and so that's why he wants to be around these people. You know, that, that's just the way he is. What was the attraction for for the women to him? Well, because because there's, there's no more interesting party guest. There's nobody funnier. There's nobody there's, there's nobody with more gossip that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. He's just uh, full of charm. He just he, he was the person. Who, his problem was wherever he went, he had to entertain. He didn't. He had to. But he expected to entertain. Now, here comes Truman Capote. So he was singing for his supper in a way when he would go yeah, to the parties. And as a gay man of that era, he knew that the, the door could turn shut, shut, could shut on him any day. Now the women, how did they influence him as a as a writer as well as as giving him an entry into that world? Well, they they gave him the set, the material for his book. That was the whole idea. The problem was that he 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 really couldn't do it. He, had, he had massive troubles trying to write this thing. Was he honest with them about what he was doing when he said, "You know, when you tell me that fascinating story, I'm filing it away to use it"? Well, they knew in some way, but look, here's this great writer. He's a great writer. He thinks he's a genius, and he probably is. Hey, I'm going to be in his book. I'm going to be in this masterpiece. I'm going to be immortal. So, so that's what they thought they were going to be in, not this tawdry, um, gossipy little thing that just tears them apart. Because he did, you know, and then in the end, betray them with, you know, in, in that story, in the stories that he published in Esquire, Le Cote Basque, and the other, uh, the Mojave was the other chapter that he, that he published. I mean, that was his his way of saying, you know, this is what I've been working on, and it did not have the effect that he thought it would. They were not flattered or pleased or excited by it. Well, and he had plenty of lessons. Uh, Morella Agnelli, who was one of the swans, who was an Italian princess, uh, her, her husband was Johnny Agnelli, the head of Fiat. Uh, Truman was on their yacht, and uh, he he had, he wanted Morella to read part of, to, to to hear part of part of answered prayers, and he read it to her, and she said, "Truman, no, no, this is this isn't you. This is worthless. Just gossip. It's not right." And uh, his biographer Gerald Clark, in the summer before he published in 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 in, in Esquire, said that you know these people aren't going to like this. They're 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 they're, they're going to be so angry with you for doing this, saying these things about him. And Truman said, "Well, they're just too dumb. They won't they won't understand it." He was a, he was an incredibly arrogant person, and and with that immense talent, often comes immense arrogance, and that was his case. Do you think he honestly believed that they that they wouldn't recognize themselves, or do you think that he was just he was so intent on going forward that he decided to ignore whatever repercussions there might be? You know, some of the things were just so obvious that he had to to think they would know. He, he just didn't care, and he didn't realize 
when he lost their friendships, he didn't realize how crucial that was to him, those social relationships. And that's when he turned to drinking and drugs. Yeah, the women weren't necessary. They weren't passive, you know, actors in the story. They, you know, they promoted him. They helped him, didn't they? Yeah, and mem remember what the, what he said about these women. They, the, first of all, they all were tall. They all were very tall, maybe five seven to five eight, which at that time was, you know, that was what now would be kind of fairly ordinary, but but not then. And they were beautiful in a way that they created their beauty. And, and Truman said, when you're 20, you can be beautiful. But when you're 40 and 50, you maintain that. And it's sort of anorexia was the occupational disease of these women. But they maintained this incredible persona. So when they go into these fancy restaurants, everybody would turn to look at them. And Truman said, this was their art. These women had created their, turned themselves into art. And that's why you look at the pictures in the book, you look at the cover in Babe Paley, and, and with the, there's a kind of sadness in her in her face there, but that 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 was the beautiful that was that's her creation. That picture is her creation. And you look at the other pictures of these of, of, of their beauties, beauty the women. It's it's the same thing. It it it, it, it was a craft and art to do this to themselves. This is a this is obviously Amelia that you know very well. Your your previous work on the the Kennedy women. Is that how you came to this particular story? No, uh, I uh, have a friend, Susan Zarinsky. If you if you saw the film broadcast news years ago, she was the, the heroine of that, this feisty principled young woman. That's what she really is. And she became the, the president of CBS News, the first woman president. I thought, what a great book that would be. So I went to her and said, I'm, I like that. She said, well, and I could only do it if she cooperated. And she wasn't sure if she wanted this to be done or not. And while she was deciding, I started doing a lot of reading. And I read this book about William S. Paley. And I read about Babe Paley. And I found Babe far more interesting than her, than her husband. And through looking at her, I, you know, I looked at the other women, the, the other swans, and Truman Capote. And I thought to myself, you know, Truman Capote was a brilliant, brilliant writer. He thought there was a masterpiece in this in this subject. He couldn't write it. But, it, but, but it's got to be a great subject. Just tell the story of these women and Truman, and, you, and you'll have one heck of a book. And that's what's happening. What was your, what was your opinion of Capote as a writer before you started this project? And did it change as you researched? Well, I mean, look, as a nonfiction writer grew up in the 60s, in cold blood, it changed everything. I mean, that he he created. Uh, he he said he invented the nonfiction novel. I, I, he really didn't do that. There were other examples of that before, but he broadened it out. He broadened it out and and made it and created a whole new genre. So as a young writer going to, to when I went to Columbia School of Journalism in 1968 69, I, I wanted to write for magazines because Norman Mailer was writing for for ma magazines. Tom Wolfe was writing these stories. That was the most exciting thing going on. So that's how I got into it. And Truman was part of the reason I wanted to become a writer. Were you, was that high opinion of him affected in any way by the, the personal failings that your book deals with? You know, I really care for the man. And I think it's too bad that so much of our time is spent talking about his dissipation and his drinking. That was just the last few years. He was a magnificent talent. And it, it's a great loss what this man could have done and should have done. All of the, not all of the women um, turned their backs on him. It was Lucy Guest, right, wasn't it, that, that was, remained friends with him after a fashion. Did, did any of the others ever contact him again after the story was published? Well, Lee Roswell stayed a friend for a while, uh, but yeah. he didn't turn on them. I mean, he turned on Jackie. I mean, Lee was so jealous of her older sister. And as part of the friendship, Truman went on the attack and said all these nasty things in, in that chapter in Answer Pairs. He sort of describes her as looking like a man and, uh, and, and just really ugly things about her that were, not, that were not true, but they were the kind of things that Lee liked. And that's what he thought he would do as her friend. The, the others, though, were very affected by, you know, the way that he described them and some of the stories that he told in, in, um, in the story in Esquire that he published. What was the effect and the, the fallout of that for, for him personally? Well, th think of Babe Paley. There was a story that was clearly based on her husband, and she, 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 he, he wants to sleep with Governor 
the gov governor Harriman's wife to to uh, to show he's Jewish and he's banned from a club says kids can't go to these certain schools to certain places that can't go and to get even it's, it's a strange idea but to get even with them he wants to sleep with the governor's wife and and he does does in their small apartment and uh, it's a kind of ugly petty vicious little story it may not even have been true but it was clearly based on the Paleys and when, when and when she read that. She was devastated. This was her closest friend. How could he do this to her? Is there ever any explanation for, you know, did he ever express any remorse about it? No. Uh -uh. no. Uh -uh. He, he, he basically was a very isolated man. I mean, with, mm -hmm. with, with his incredible talent and with the celebrity, which has a devastating impact on him, he was very isolated. Mm -hmm. When I was reading your book, I thought, you know, a lot of the, like a lot of the writers of his time, he sort of created a character of himself and then inhabited it so fully that the, the person, the writer got lost in it. And you get the sense that he, that he wanted to do more as a writer, but that he simply wasn't able to overcome his own demons. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, his long-term lover said that, that, you know, he, he, he told me to get a phone call in the morning and say, I'm working on my book. And he's basically lying in bed looking at movie magazines. He just couldn't discipline. It's so hard. It's so hard to, to, become, to be a writer and day after day be by yourself and, and do this. And once this massive celebrity hits you, it's very hard to go back and live the way you did before. And you have to live that way to write your books. As a writer, you're, you know, when you're writing these stories, when you're structuring these narratives, how do you decide what, um, you know, how to structure the narrative and, and what parts of your research to include and what to leave out? Well, okay. You read this book, and it seem, I hope it seems kind of seamless. It seems like this is the way it should be. There's, this is the one way to do it. But believe me, it, it took a lot of work and moving chapters back and forth and sections back and forth to have it so it works. So, it's, so, it's, so it reads like a novel, basically. And that, that was the idea, but it was, not, it was not easy to do. Did you write it in pieces and then assemble the pieces? Is that... What you're somewhat. I, did, I didn't think there were pieces, but they, but they turned out to be pieces. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as anybody would tell you, it's the rewriting that matters. You, 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 you got to rewrite again and again and work things back and forth. That's what it's all about. Have any of the, um, any of the women, uh, do they have living descendants who are, who are aware of all of this, who are affected by it? Can you tell us sort of how this story has sort of reverberated since it happened? Well, I think it's a curse often to be an inheritor, okay, especially in America where we, 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 we're so obsessed with achievement. And these, the next generation, they had the money, the, their, 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 their parents had been so enormous in society, and they, they kind of disappear or they're, not, they're nothing like their parents. So no then. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And and can you blame them <laughs> in a way? No, no. Well, well, they had lousy parents. They had lousy parents in, in, in the elite upper class society in America. So often the kids are just shuttled aside. I mean, I, I find that the strangest thing. But if I had let if I had all that money, okay, why would you why would you send your kids off? I mean, if you have children, you don't want to be with your children. And why don't you want to sleep in the same room with your wife? I thought that's what it was all about. But if you get rich, that's what you, that's how you behave. It's just bizarre from from my point of view, from my middle class point of view, from which I'll, that I'll never leave. <laughs> well, you have so many rooms in the house. You have to put one person in each one, maybe, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I want to remind folks as we're as we're chatting here that if there are questions, um, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box. In a, a couple of minutes, I'm going to start reading those out. So please get those questions in. We'll get to as many of those as we as we possibly can. Tell us a little bit about your research process, um, archives, letters, the things that you dug into to tell this story in such an immediate and vivid way. Well, I was very limited. Okay, the New York Public with the, with the pandemic, the New York Public Library was closed, so I couldn't get into uh, the Capote Papers. The Library of Congress was 
closed. It was, it was open for a while. I got in there for a couple of months and I had no idea that it would close. So it didn't finish up. But, it, but so I couldn't get, I shouldn't get, couldn't get into Pamela Harriman's papers. A lot of things I couldn't get. So and I wanted to go to Italy. I wanted to go to Turin and talk to Marelli Agnelli's relatives and, and friends. I couldn't do that. So I was quite limited in what I, what, 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 what I could do. And uh, I did the best. I don't think it, I hope it doesn't read like there's something lacking there. I tried very hard to make it work. Were you able to do um, any types of phone conversations or Zoom conferences with any of the folks you wanted to go and interview? Yes, but, 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 but remember most, the, the, the swans are, are all deceased. Right. And the the children and, and others, they, they really don't know that much about the period I'm interested in. Well, and it was sort of, it's sort of an ugly incident to, to explain to them some, you know, some of it too. Right, right. And they don't want to, my Cornelia Guest I talked to, Cece Guest's uh, uh, daughter. And uh, Cece Guest, yeah. And when, uh, wow. I, I, when we're talking to her, I mentioned the financial problems they had, and that's one of the keys to the material about her. They didn't have the money they pretended they had, and they had to, they had to downsize. Okay, which is, is downsized to a place that anybody anybody would think is a palace. All right, but that but that was their life. And uh, boy, when I mentioned financial problems, she just got angry. You're not going to talk about that. Heavens, Betsy, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's the the yeah the 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 drinking and the drugs and the sex and the the affairs and that's all fair game, but don't talk about the money. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's amazing. Well, we're going to take a few a uh, few. We've got a few audience questions coming in, so I want to make sure that we get to a few of those. But folks, please um, type those into the Q and A box um, at the bottom in the middle of your screen. Here, we'll uh, we'll take a few of those. Um, Randy Chapman wants to know, is there a plan to film The Swans of Fifth Avenue? Uh, well, that's a different book. That's a different book, yeah. So that's, you know, but but any sort of, no, I, I suppose we could ask any sort of film of this particular no, no. period. In I know career. that book was, op was optioned and it hasn't been done. I, I get these, I had one of the top producers in Hollywood call me last two weeks ago and, and said that this, he, he, he loved the book so much, he, he, at the end he read it as slowly as possible as it wouldn't end, and he'd be back the next week as he wanted to make a movie out of it, and he never got back to me. So that's what happens. So, so but, but there's, there's quite a bit of movie buzz on this one, but who knows? Who knows? I mean, I've had so many movie options and nothing ever got finally made. I mean, I've, you know, I've done quite well with the options. It seems, it seems like it would be a perfect cinematic story given the, the beauty of these women and their, you know, their notoriety. Oh no, it would make a great movie. Well, well it, may, it, may, it may happen, who knows? Yeah, yeah. Got a question from Angela Bliss, who wants to, who asks, it seems that the relationship with the Swans was largely transactional. Do you agree? And had it been less transactional, might the writing of answered prayers have gone better? Boy, that's a fabulous question. Yeah, I mean, Tr Truman was with them because he wanted material out of them. They, what did they get out of it? He was just a fascinating person to have around, but, uh, yeah, maybe if Truman had been a better human being, he would have had his masterpiece. So if they were willing participants in a, a research. If he, if he were more intellectually honest about what he was doing, okay, and, and, and when he dealt with them. And he would, uh, I mean, the betrayal wasn't just the, the November uh, 1975 Esquire story. He would be with one, he'd, he'd, he'd be so positive, and, and, he'd, and he'd dish the others, the, the other swans, say bad things about them. Then he'd go away and be with the next one. There, there was a manicurist that, that worked on most of these swans, and she, and she despised Truman because she would be there, he, Truman would be there, and, 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 and she heard the way, the way the terrible things he said about these women. Yeah, he would he would trash talk one to the other to the others, and the two was out of earshot. Exactly. It's a good thing he didn't have access to social media. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> he he would have done fine just now, I think. You know, he he would have been a great character. And Swans, they oh. 
but they would be able to monetize what they're doing. That, that's what women do now that, that, that are incredibly well-dressed and beautiful. They monetize their every moment. There would be babe Pelly dresses and babe Pelly necklaces and perfume, everything, everything with her name on it. They were the Instagram influencers before there were such things. Exactly. I thought that reading the book, I thought these, these women would absolutely own all of, uh, all of fashion, fashion media. But you know, it's funny because I, I, I worked in the Watcher, Iowa Patriot Chronicle. And, and when I went, I went to Antioch College, I had the work study program. So I spent three months in that little town. And it was in the high school, the young men dressed in blue jeans and white, and white t-shirts and the young women, and they wanted to be farmers like their fathers. The young women, they dressed differently. They went to J.C. Penney's in Sioux City and other places and got these clothes that were knockoffs of the Swans dresses. They were 10, for 10, 11, 10 or 11 dollars, you could get these dresses. They wore those dresses and they didn't want to have their mother's life. I mean, before the, the feminist revolution, they already got it. They wanted something different. Yeah, and, so they, and that, and that's what dress meant to them. Well, and that that influ that points to the influence of these women as well, and how far it reached. That it wasn't just you know one neighborhood in New York that they their influence was felt worldwide. No one and uh, other women and young women saw that and wanted to be like them. Yeah, and and, and there were columnists, there were fashion and columnists that, that had enormous audiences back then. Yeah, and what about the Swans? Yeah. I have a question here from Aaron Shirley, who wants to know, um, first of all, if there are signed copies of the book available, and if you order through our uh, bookseller partner at Seminary Co-op, Aaron, yes, there will be uh, copies of uh, signed book plates that will be available um, with those uh, with those books. Um, yeah, I signed them. I signed them and sent, sent them to you, so you probably have them by now. Absolutely. Just make sure to note that in the in the comments of your order, Aaron, and they'll uh, they'll hook you up there. So Aaron also wants to know: Were the women competitive over their friendship with Capote? Did everybody want to be his best friend? Well, he he was the best friend of whichever one he was with. Yet, yes, they were they were competitive. They were competitive about their looks. They were competitive about everything. And he obviously knew that, and and would stoke that in them. Yeah, I mean, he was a. He was a nasty little gossip in his way. He liked turmoil, okay? Wherever he was, he wanted turmoil. Tur turmoil was exciting to him. I mean, he, uh, he, he wanted to be at a party where all these kind of weird things are going on. That was fun to him. He wanted to be at the center of the action, wherever that was. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and it worked very well for him as a writer for a very long time. No, it did. It did. And he, and he, he, was, a, he was a magnificent talent. Remember, when he was eight or nine years old, he was always right, already a writer. He knew he wanted to write. That's that's a, a heck of an age to make that kind of decision and, and go after it. Right. Yeah. We have a question from Mary who wants to know, given the inability to do as, uh, research as you'd like, did you consider delaying publishing the book? Uh, well, my publisher didn't. No, no. <laughs> I, I felt I look read it and if you and if you, and you think there's something lacking send it back and get your money back but i think i del i think i delivered and the publisher thinks i delivered and so far fingers crossed the reviews have been very positive they've been it's been getting wonderful reviews yeah, yeah. yeah. i have a question from another question from angela who wants to know if truman was ever interested in meeting grace kelly or met grace kelly when she was princess of monaco because it seems she would have been a good swan yeah she would have been she would have been a good swan definitely i'm trying to think how tall she was because they were all so tall but uh no i don't i don't, I don't think he, he may have but but i don't know did they adopt the they he was he called them his swans did they they eagerly adopted that they adopted it in, in, in a way. Uh, Mara Agnelli was the last one to die a couple of years ago, and she called her, her book The Last Swan. Okay. So it obviously stuck with her a very long time. Yeah, yes. And, and, and he, he did appreciate what they did and, 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 and how unusual they were. Was there a portion of the book that you wanted to read to us tonight? I didn't want to end before we got to that. Well, uh, the, the, the book ends telling the story 
An incredibly funny story. And I don't tell in the first person. Okay, my regret is not that I, not that I didn't do more research. My regret is I didn't tell the story in the first person. And it dealt with Joanne Carson. Joanne Carson, Truman Capote died in her arms. And, 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 and Truman then, to, and, and Joanne then took half the ashes for herself and half, to, half for, for Truman's long-term lover. Uh, uh, four years later, she said that Truman gave a, a party. She gave a party. Uh, she said that Truman had done a reporting and re recording and told her how to do this party. She gave the party. No, it, it was kind of disappointing. But she, she wanted to get publicity for it. And in the middle of the party, she came in, she ran out and screaming and saying that somebody had stolen Truman's ashes, they had stolen his final manuscript, and they'd stolen $200,000 worth of jewelry. Well, if they did that to you, you'd call the police. You didn't call the police because she made it up to get attention. And she, and she called me a few days later, hysterical, because she said the thief, the theft had returned the ashes. And so uh, oh, no. we, we, drove, we drove around LA trying to figure out what to do. And w finally, I remember the Westwood Memorial Chapel where, where Marilyn Monroe's ashes were, are. So we drove over there and we went to these, these, these mausoleums, these, these crypts, and, tr and the, Peter Lawford's was there, but the Kennedys hadn't paid for it. So uh, she cut a price. They took Peter Lawford's out of there. She, could, she had half ashes. She couldn't stand to, to lose those. So she took out half of those. So it's basically a quarter of Truman's ashes. And she put 100% of her, her dog's ashes in it and put it in there. It says Truman Capote, but that's what it is. And when she died, when, when she died, the, 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 the ashes, basically a quarter of Truman's ashes, were auctioned off for something like $50,000. And so, 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 so that's how Truman's, uh, that's how Truman's, uh, yeah, that, that was the tr end of Truman. And uh, even, so, even in, even in death, he, he had to be the center of attention and the cause of drama. Right. So I use that as the epilogue of the book. And then, and then I write, what a, what a marvel, this is the ending of the book. What a marvelous set piece Truman would have made of this tale. Nothing in life was too bizarre for his scrutiny. If he was sitting over dinner with his swans, he would have regaled them with this business, spinning it out in all kinds of ways. Uh, I, I should give it a second. Napoleon's penis was sold for $7,000. And when the auction house sold Truman's ashes, they, that was their excuse. They said, Truman, if they can sell Napoleon's penis, we can sell Truman's ashes. Napoleon's was not the best penis he would have ever seen. Time described it as looking like a maltreated strip of buckskin shoelace, but it had once been attached to the invader of Russia and ruler of half of Europe, and a quarter of Truman's ashes had gone for 15 times the price. Truman understood the myriad ironies of his life better than anyone. He had written two books that would live, In Cold Blood and Breakfast at Tiffany's but he had not finished his self-described masterpiece, Answered Prayers. Brilliant of mind, merciless in ambition, shrewd in social relations, Truman believed that he could enter the swan's domain and leave with the chef d'oeuvre in his hand. But he had gotten all tangled up in the swan's world and in his own personal demons. In the end, Answered Prayers proved to be as much Truman's stories as, story as it was the swan's. People bid for Truman's presence in death and bid royally, just as they had in life. As long as people read Truman's books, talk about him, and fight over some measure of his presence, he's still alive, beguiling the world with his stories. Just so. Just so. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. I apologize again to everyone who who hung with us for the uh, the technical difficulties, but we uh, we made it through, and uh, it's it's much appreciated. Um, I just want to let everyone know that if you go into the chat, um, you can find the link to purchase Capote's Women from Seminary Co-op Bookstore. And Lauren Sleemer, thank you again so much for joining us this evening. Thank you very very much. Have a wonderful night. Bye now. Thank you.